Welcome to another episode of the Superfly Boxing Podcast with me, your host, Carl McLaughlin of the Fight Site. Um, obviously, these podcasts are relatively intermittent, but uh, if you're subscribed to the YouTube channel or the podcast feed on Spotify or Apple, then uh, obviously you would have got a lot of great content anyway, so uh, it's not like you've been missing out on stuff, but uh, we only want to do these Superfly podcasts when there's something to really talk about or when we get great interviews like uh, our man Taylor Higgins did with Russ Amber. But you know, I can't be alone, so I've got one of my fight sort cohort fight site cohorts in with me, uh, Philippe Pacholi Marchetti. Phil, introduce yourself to anyone who's not aware of your work, but I'm sure they are if they've been following the fight site. Hi, Kai, how are you, my man? So, um, first time I'm on the podcast, so I'm very happy about it. I'm happy you're here. And, uh, uh, yeah, for boxing and MMA analyst for the fight site. I also do some video breakdown from time to time. And uh, yeah, I, I used to box a little bit. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about boxing. It's going to be fun. I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, we've got a few topics. We've got a little rundown at the beginning uh, of a topic that's very close to my heart. And then we're going to run through some patron requests and patron questions. So a lot of different topics today. Um, and no doubt, Phil and I will not be uh, short of anything to say. So I just want to start off on a, on a bit of a down note, um, but it's going to be it's going to end on an up note. Uh, one of my favourite fighters of all time, Ernesto Marcel, died about a week ago to uh, about a week ago, and uh, he's absolutely one of my favourite fighters of all time, and uh, absolutely one of the greatest featherweights of all time in my opinion. Didn't have the bout for long. Uh, should have had the, the WBC bout that he was robbed of against a uh, great Japanese fighter called Kuniaki Shibata and later won the WBA against an uh, excellent uh, Venezuelan uh, called Alfonso Gomez. and uh, Antonio Gomez. Antonio Gomez, sorry. Antonio Gomez. Uh, he was an excellent fighter in his own right. If you watch him, uh, very much like uh, Juan Manuel Marquez, brilliant counterpuncher. And... Uh, and then, of course, Marcel finished his career against the great Alexis Arguello, who's not the great Alexis Arguello at that stage. But if you watch the footage of the fight, he was evidently a brilliant fighter. Uh, Marcel had a few uh, losses in his career. One of them was early on to Roberto Duran uh, in a very, in very much a, a Panama super fight of uh, great prospects. Um, and Marcel was his first love was basketball, and he retired very young due to his mother not wanting him to box anymore. He would have boxed. Ruben Olivares in the defence of his title if he'd, uh, if he'd carried on. And, of course, Alexis Arguello and Olivares had that classic for the vacant title. So, uh, but you watch Marcel and he was very much, he was a genius, really. Great footwork, great timing, excellent rhythm, uh, could box, could, could, could pressure. Uh, he's very great at pivoting and switching in and out, out of uh, the pocket and very elusive. Uh, a ring general. It sounds like I'm hyping this guy up to be more than he was, but he really was that great. Phil, obviously, you've watched Marcel. Thoughts on him as an operator and uh, and uh, what you think of him as a champion? Yeah, it's funny. We just watched Bernard Whitaker like a few minutes ago for another content. And we go from one very crafty fighter with excellent footwork to another one. So, so my story with Ernesto Marcel is pretty, pretty short because I only discovered him like last year when you guys talked to me about him. Even though I, I know my boxing history, you can never know, you know, every boxer in history. And I knew who he was, but I never, never got to watch the, the footage, especially because the, the Duran fight, it's kind of like the footage is very, very old, not in the best, best, the best shape. But so when you and other people from the site or on Twitter, Told me, oh, dude, you gotta check Marcel, and I knew that you, Kyle, you insist as much as I watch Marcel than to watch uh, Chang. Yeah, I did, I did. Uh, so one I was like, favorites. okay, that guy must be, he must be something. And so I watched his fight, and I was blown away. I was like, that guy is so, he was so ahead of his time. Like it's crazy, and something that is so beautiful about um, Marcel is that he made it look easy. Like when you watch Whitaker, it's almost the same thing. You just, you know, 
when you break down, often a fighter, you will say, oh, this guy has that right hand that is set up like this. is very dangerous on the front foot. Marcel, he was just brilliant all fight long. Doesn't matter which position he was. It was just it was beautiful to see him flow in the ring. You know what I mean? Like we did a small video when he passed away last week where I put some John Coltrane music and you could just watch him uh, flow in rhythm, entering the rage, escaping on another angle, giving so many looks to his opponent. And uh, he is one of the two boxers that I can think of that is good all fight long and not in just a few compartments of the fighting. Like he doesn't have a weakness. Maybe he wasn't the hardest puncher. I would say that probably that. But there wasn't... Is someone to really get how good he was, you need to watch the fights um, full from start to finish. Because he was also the king of adjustment. And uh, one fight in particular that I will encourage people to watch, and I watch it with Kyle, I think maybe when we start the Discord and the Patreon, was the fight against Antonio Gomez. This is one of the best performances I saw in the ring, period. Absolutely. I mean, people... If you, if you tell people online, you know, people say, who's the best featherweight of all time? And best is obviously different to greatest. You know, greatest is tied in with achievement. And best is all about skill in the ring and, you know, who would beat who. And I tell people, I nest my cell and they say, well, I've not really heard of him. And I say, watch the fights. And everybody who knows boxing comes back to me and says, how, how have I not heard of this guy before? And like you said, you can't know everybody from history. Even me, I mean, I do a lot of research on boxing history. Every so often, a fighter will come up and I'll go, wow, I've got to research this guy. I've got to know everything about this guy because of uh, it's like a revelation. And Marcel, about 10 years ago, when I first, what the first footage I saw of Marcel was against Duran when I was watching all of Duran's career, maybe about, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, uh, because uh, you and I, we're, we're old. Um, and, you know, I thought, yeah, he looked, he looked pretty good. And I thought, that's a bullshit stoppage, man. You know, even I thought, that's weird. I had to research and it sort of said that Marcel was stopped for inactivity or, you know, he was giving up. And I thought, well, he's just boxing, you know. He's just trying to see out the end of the fight. He'd already lost the fight on points and they threw him out um, because obviously Duran was really popular in Panama and uh, they threw the, the fight out and, the, and he won on, uh, by TKO. It's bullshit. And then I had guys on the forums... It's probably 10 or 12 years ago, um, probably longer than that. I say, I forget how old I am sometimes, saying, you've got to watch Marcel, you've got to watch Marcel. So I spoke to some collectors and uh, some guys that I used to do trading with and buy, buy footage from, and they said, don't worry, I'll send you Marcel. My, my friend said to me, I won't charge you, I'll send you Marcel. You're going to love this. And he sent me everything he had. And I just, I mean, it really is a revelation. It blows your mind. People watch Lomachenko today and think, wow, has anyone ever fought this good before? Watch some older fighters. Watch Panel Whitaker. Watch Ernesto Marcel. Oh, my God. There's so many great fighters out there. And you, as you say, you can never know them all. I just want to tell everyone, especially now he's passed, if there's only one new boxer you try and get into this year, please make it Ernesto Marcel. Um, I've uploaded uh, two of his, uh, three of his fights to to YouTube, the uh, Shibata fight, which again is a terrible decision. It's a draw in Japan. And Marcel, I mean, you've seen that fight, Phil. It's a, a easy robbery. Um, and we don't throw robbery around lightly. Um, if you're not a patron, sign up to the patron uh, for just $3. Um, you can view the commentary that Phil and I have just done on uh, Panel Whitaker and De La Hoya. We don't throw robbery around easily. Um, but that is a robbery. Uh, his first fight of Antonio Gomez, and which, uh, like Phil said, one of the best performances of all time. It really is one of the best ever filmed performances. And then his final fight against uh, Alexis Arguello, who's one of the all-time greats, a greater fighter than Marcel, but not a better featherweight than him. So um, we want to say, you know, rest in power, Ernesto Marcel, uh, truly phenomenal fighter. And uh, the reason I started getting into writing about boxing history, I was already a fan of it. The only reason I started getting into writing about boxing history was to get the names of these fighters out there so their their legacies could live on. So please, listen to what we say, watch Ernesto Marcel, and make sure that you tell your friends about him because if there's one thing we should do as historians and as boxing fans is to make sure that the next generation doesn't forget about these great fighters. Without us, they will. So, as we say, I want to say uh, thanks you. Thank, if you're, you I'm not a religious guy, but if Ernesto Marcel was up there, Thank you so much for all the enjoyment you've given us. And uh, you really did have a legendary career, even though only a small amount of people know about it. 
Yeah, that was great, guy. I agree. And uh, just to come back to what you said about Kuniaki Shibata, the fight, I swear to God, if you read on Wikipedia, box track, whatever, the score, you'll be like, oh, it was a close fight. It was a beat down. It was a beautiful beat down. And not a violent beat down. Like, it just it was a masterpiece. And Shibata, credit to him, he had like a crazy chin. He was so tough and everything. But that's one good fight to watch from Ernesto Marcel. And, you know, you kind of cherish the footage you have of him because there isn't that many fights. Maybe four, five fights do we have on him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Four fights. Uh, and I, I like what you said that the first reason I start to write about boxing and doing content and everything, even though I'm not an historian, is that when you become a, a combat sport fan or a fan of history of a sport, you, you kind of like become used to live with ghosts because you never met those guys because they mm. fought at the time you were even born, but you love them. As soon as I watched Anastasia, I was like, God damn, I wish. I was alive when he was fighting. And of course, I never met him. He never had like a real impact in my life or whatever, especially because I know him late. But, but, but I was very sad to hear that he passed away. And yeah, I think it's great to give tribute to the real ones. And for sure, he is one beautiful, amazing boxer. And from now on, I will not miss an opportunity to watch his fight or and, break it down or, or give advice to people to watching. And yeah, I'm, still, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to be looking for footage. I know there's more footage of him out there. Just got to find it. I know it's out there. I know for a fact that other fights of his were recorded. Just got to find it. And, uh, you know, there's certain things I've found and that my friends have found that I never thought I'd see. So there's still hope out there to find more myself fights. And just one little quick note before we move on. And this is a positive note. People will go, oh, watch an old fight. I mean, we already said the Duran fight was in such bad quality. Trust me, the Shibata fight is in beautiful, pristine, nearly film quality. The Japanese were filming on color film, even in the 70s. And you know as well as I do, Phil, beautiful quality to watch. It doesn't feel like you're watching an old fight. So if anyone out there that thinks, I don't really want to watch the old timers, watch that fight. It's just like watching a fight from today. So my YouTube channel, I don't make any money from my YouTube channel. I only want you to watch it so you can appreciate Ernesto Marcel. And as we say... Rest in peace, Ernesto. Truly uh, amazing champion. But we're going to move on to some other topics now. Uh, we've got some long outstanding patron topics. We're going to we're going to work from the from the oldest. I'm going to read the question out. This is from our patron Ollie Carlson. Uh, not to be confused with our Ollie, who writes to the fight site, but a really really cool guy in his own right and uh, somewhat of a writer as well. Uh, real smart kid. And uh, Ollie asks, as someone with virtually no knowledge of past generations of boxers. Can you guys give an overview of, in your opinion, the greatest boxers of the 20th century? I know it's a general question, so feel free to add parameters or interpret however you wish. Cheers. No, cheers to you, Ollie, because that's a really, really good question. Now, I think the way we're going to do this is we're going to quickly run off, you know, a few fighters that we think are great um, from the 20th century. But I'm going to give Ollie one guy from pre-war to watch and to do some research on. And Phil, if you want... You can take a guy from post-war and, uh, you know, I know for a fact who you're going to pick already. Um, so I'm going to give a quick rundown of who I think the best boxers of the 20th century are. This is sort of going to give a, a top five of my sort of pound for pound because uh, all of the guys that are in my top five pound for pound uh, are from the 20th century anyway. So I think the, uh, the first guy in my pound for pound that isn't from the 20th century or his prime wasn't from the 20th century it was Bob Fitzsimmons, and I haven't just outside the top 10. So my top five pound for pound would be, uh, number one would be Harry Greb. Well, there's no footage of him, Ollie, so I want you to research him, but I want to give you something to watch. So we're going to cross Harry Greb off the list. Number two is Henry Armstrong, a uh, free weight champion, one of the best uh, pressure fighters and uh, inside fighters of all time. Uh, there's some footage out there of him to watch, and I would definitely recommend it, but it's not the guy I'm going to recommend because I'm going to go right before pre-war. We're going to get there. Number three is Sugar Ray Robinson. Now, Ollie, if you want to watch Sugar Ray Robinson and, and, and dismiss my my uh, my opinion, then feel free to do so because you have a whale of a time watching Sugar Ray Robinson. Uh, but number four is Sam Langford. And Sam Langford is the guy that I'm going to recommend you to watch, Ollie, because... Uh, Basically, you'll get a chance to see one of the best fighters of the early 20th century. And I find it quite educational to do so because, and Phil will back me up here, there's a lot of bad talk 
uh, a lot of bad stuff said about operators from the early 20th century saying they weren't that good and it was too old fashioned. And I'm telling you now, if you watch Sam Langford, you will find that he's one of the best fighters you ever see. Excellent hand fighter, pressure fighter, cut off the ring excellently, massive puncher, really varied offensive arsenal. Let me just run over some of the things that he did. He fought Joe Gans, who's one of the best lightweights of all time. He fought Barbados Joe Walcott, who's one of the best weights of all time. He fought Stanley Ketchell, who's one of the best middleweights of all time. And he fought a plethora of light heavyweights and heavyweights. And Sam Langford himself is one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Uh, my friend uh, Matt McGrain, who writes for SweetScience.com, uh, he had Langford as his number one pound for pound of all time. And you can definitely make a case. Uh, he's from, uh, I believe, Nova Scotia. So he's Canadian. Uh, his name... at uh, given to him at the time was the Boston Tar Baby because he did fight out of Boston for a bit and uh, you know which obviously nowadays you certainly wouldn't call a black fighter that but I, f- I believe it was done affectionately Sam Langford was a pretty popular guy and uh, he fought Jack Johnson famously one of the, probably one of the best heavyweights of all time but when they were both in their physical prime Jack Johnson really didn't want anything to do with Sam Langford. Even years after Sam Langford was uh, past his best, Jack Dempsey was a little bit wary of him. There's a lot of reverence there. He wasn't scared of him, but Jack Dempsey respected Sam Langford even when he was pretty much blind. So if you watch Sam Langford, and there is footage of him in uh, one of his fights against Joe Jeanette, who's one of the other top black heavyweights at the time, uh, and fireman Jim Flynn, uh, who's a good white fighter, and uh, there's one other as well against an Aussie heavyweight, and it's terrible that I can't. Uh, Bill Lang. Bill Lang's the other one. I did not have to search. Bill Lang. And you get to see Langford, and you will see how he fainted people, how he set traps, how he built on his strategy as the fight went on. And his whole purpose basically was to knock people out. He's truly one of the hardest punches that ever lived. As I say, punch from lightweight all the way to heavyweight. And if you watch the footage of him, Unlike the Marcel footage we spoke about, it is really old-fashioned, although people have done the things to maybe colorize it or make it more HD. But I find that Langford, who, by the way, was only like five foot six, really long arms. Uh, Langford comes across as some kind of mix of, I don't know, he's like, he kind of looks like a mix between like Liston and George Foreman in the ring. You know what I mean? He's a power boxer, but real smart, real strong. And I think, Ollie, you'll really enjoy watching him. My number five in my top list is... Roberto Duran. Phil? Or is he pretty well? I didn't hear what you just said. Did you say you would do the top five? Oh, you did your top five path, but I thought you were Olympic fighter from before the World War II. Yeah, That's so I, I, I picked my top five, but the guy um, that I want no, to no, is Sam Langford, but my number five is Roberto Duran. Um fine with it it's a good pick <laughs> so do you want to tell ollie about roberto duran and why you think that maybe he should give him a look because we've already kind of spoke about yeah. duran on this podcast yeah 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 so um we've been a bit late on it but i, I recommend Oli to check the boxing nostalgia series that i'm doing there's a duran one that will be out in a few in a few days anyway and so yes yeah, so roberto duran there's so much to say because he has maybe 119 fights i think and and thank God there's many fights of him that you can check that are in pretty good quality. And yeah, of course, if you're talking boxing, started from the 70s, to me, is, is the number one. Because he was so good everywhere, but also because he fought... ...top competition all the time. And, and you run some breaking dash, and you don't really understand the substance of what he will do on the inside. You will quickly get it watching a few videos on YouTube, and then you can understand the mechanic and the process. And um, and yeah, I, I also recommend to start by you know, by the big fights, like the fights with Sugar Leonard, the Hagler, uh, even though he lost, he was great, the, the Barkley and everything. But please, please check Leonard's reign at lightweight in the 70s, because you can see the evolution of Roberto Duran pretty clearly from beginning of the 70s to like mid 70s late 70s and yeah there's there's really i don't think i ever saw a fighter maybe sugar robinson that i watched like 10 seconds i'm like oh the fuck is that guy that guy is the best it's like it's an instant connection and um and yeah roberto had a real career you know I, even though he's an, one of the all-time great like we said one of the best ever 
he has like a crazy journey and to me the journey is very important too it's not only just the, the footage and what you see is that he fought guys that beat him up he beat him up a lot of guys and in different ways and he's the king of adjustment also so i really recommend to 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 take a long 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 dive in in roberto Duran's career because once you've done him you will learn a lot about boxing absolutely i want to echo what you said if you watch certain fights from Duran, like the ken buchanan fight like the uh, trilogy with Esteban de Jesus, the two Ray Leonard, uh, the three Ray Leonard fights, but I wouldn't watch the third one. But watch the first one, certainly, if you're trying to get a good grasp with Duran. And then watch the second one with to get a good grasp with Leonard. Now, what's great about Duran is, like you said, by watching someone like Duran, Ollie, and I'm talking directly to you here, directly to you, you don't just see Duran. You want to know about 20th century boxing. You watch Duran's career, you're going to get to see loads of the greats of the 20th century. Ken Buchanan was one of the best lightweights. You get to see Ray Leonard, who's another top 20 pound for pounder. Thomas Hearns, who's one of the top 50 fighters of all time. Marvin Hagler is one of the top 50 fighters of all time. And you can, Duran fought in five decades. Started at the end of the 60s, okay? That's how amazing this guy was. And even with his later career, like when he's like a shot fighter, you still see him do some beautiful things. Um, we pretty much both agree. I think, Phil, that uh, his fight with Barkley is probably the best ever performance by a post-prime fighter. But as Phil said, it's all about the journey. Try and watch Duran chronologically. Try and do some reading up on his career because um, his, his his career was very much like a movie, but as they, they tried to make a movie about it, and I'm sorry to say, but reality really was... Uh, Reality was much more interesting than fiction. And uh, we lost Marcel the other week. Thank God, uh, Roberto Duran uh, uh, beat COVID and uh, appears to be on the mend, which is great because I think if we lost them both in the same week, I don't think I could have taken that. But Oli, I mean, all the fighters we've mentioned, uh, you know, Henry Armstrong, highly recommend watching him. Uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, like Phil said, you watch Sugar Ray Robinson, it's insane. We were talking earlier about Marcel. People say, oh, old fighting, you know, old boxing. It's just, I can't get into it. You watch Sugar Ray Robinson, blow your mind. I don't care if you're from uh, 1945, if you're from 3045. Anyone watching Sugar Ray Robinson, you'll never get someone like that again. But Roberto Duran, he was, as Phil said, great at every range. He was a great boxer. He was one of the best defensive fighters of all time. He had one of the best chins of all time. He was one of the best punches of all time. And he was one of the best, probably the best inside fighter that ever lived. So hopefully that's giving you a nice little rundown. And uh, Ollie, you know where to find uh, Phil and I on Twitter. If you want to know anything else, then please come and ask. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out some more, my man, because you're, you're a great guy and uh, you waited way too long for this, this request. So um, you me. go on. If I may add just one thing about Duran, because I don't want, we can talk for two hours about him, more than yeah. that, but just one thing, please only watch the trilogy between Roberto Duran and Esteban de Jesus, yes. because first, it, it's probably one of the best rivalry that there was at, in lightweight boxing history, because Esteban de Jesus is kind of forgotten in history, but he was a great athlete and an amazing boxer, amazing boxer. I mean, he knocked down Duran many times, so tells you that. And uh, what's great about the trilogy without giving out what happens is that it's it's not like three fights in one year. It's pretty prolonged, like beginning of the 70s, mid and late. So as you can see, Esteban improving. You especially see Roberto Duan improving a lot from like a very aggressive bowler with heavy hands to the highest level he can ever be. And those fights are nuts. They are crazy pace. They are insane. And uh, people forget about them. They always talk about the masterpiece against Sugar Ray Leonard, all the stuff, the Hagglers. Me, my favorite one is the fight with De Jesus. So I would really recommend to watch them. Definitely. Uh, and whilst we're talking about old fighters to new and fighters that are changing, I want to get to the next patron request. It's just from uh, probably one of the most popular kids on Twitter, which is uh, Judah Carly, uh, a patron from Singapore, who's got, uh, you know, he's. It's great that he's asked us a question because most of the time people are asking him questions. So it's great that he wants to ask us. And obviously he's known as an MMA fan. I believe he's into kickboxing too. But uh, he wants to try and broaden his boxing knowledge. And uh, 
Judy Carly asked about uh, footwork and boxing and how it's changed over the years and sort of his question was a little bit vague. Um, but he, he admitted himself he hasn't watched a huge amount of boxing from yesteryear. So we're going to give you... I've spoke to him and we're going to sort of give you an idea on how... Uh, which forms of boxing we feel were stronger in previous eras than they are now. So things that have been lost, technique that has been lost. And I think really what we need to focus on would be inside fighting because... I think that if you look at inside fighting from today and inside fighting from maybe 30, 40 years ago and before, it's just not as prevalent nowadays or as, as impressive as about, it was before. Yeah. And um, recently we saw a great fight between Jared Hurd and uh, Julian Williams, J-Rock. They love Poge. Exactly. And it really did show, I think, a lot of modern boxing fans how effective it is when you've got a good inside fighter against another good inside fighter or a really good inside fighter against someone who hasn't really got a clue. Like Julian Williams did some really uh, excellent things on the inside and Jarrett Hurd, who basically looked unbeatable at that stage, he had no answer to him. He'd never seen anything like that before. So, Phil, what do you think? Uh, you know, What things would you like to see nowadays uh, more yeah. in boxing that you haven't seen of, for a while? One of the, you, You're right about the inside fighting. It's really sad when... When you get to know the, the the history of boxing and you watch the fights now, not that the fights are bad, it's just that they get separated very early, and they get separate not because the ref is bad at his job, it's because yeah. the fighters tend to just stop. You know, they will get their arms on the inside and just wait, catch a rest and, and stop working. So as soon as you stop working, of course you get separated. That's the issue, just to be to start with, and of course with the time, it kind of become normal that there is not that much inside fighting but if you take a fight like josh taylor against regis progre who happened maybe in november october last year they yeah. both were willing to fight there and it was great i remember watching it live and it felt like i was watching a good fight from the 70s because they were both so crafty and and willing to be on the inside that you see some techniques that you haven't seen for a long time and that was great and it's not a surprising thing that Regis Progre, for example, is a fan of box, is a boxing history fan. He knows all about the Duran, the Henry Armstrong and everything. So that's that's one of the reasons why it's fun to watch. And you can see that. But about footwork, I would say also that I miss my old type of boxer winning on the back foot. I still think nowadays... Maybe it's also because of MMA a little bit, I don't know. And other sp combat sports that we use that the person who's backing up is losing. And it still drives me crazy. And uh, I can name some trainers that <laughs> will piss me off about that, like Abel Sanchez, what's up? And um, yeah, so I think I, there's the two things that I kind of miss is the inside fighting and the craft of fighting on the back foot. By the way, another fight which featured, or two fights, but mainly the second fight, which featured some amazing technical infighting. And of course, it was probably one of the best fights of the year, was the second fight between uh, Canelo and Golovkin. So there are still fighters out there that know how to fight on the inside. But generally, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. And generally, as Phil said, it's more of a, you know, a change in philosophy, change in culture. Um, you know, refs not allowing guys to work out on the inside anymore, and also fighters not really knowing what to do because, uh, you know, as the amateur game changed, a lot of guys came out of the amateur game that you know basically knew how to fence with gloves, and uh, it's a lot to change those those guys in their ways and teach them other things. I mean, when we talk about inside fighting as well, it's not you know standing with shoulder to shoulder and letting shots off to the body to Judy Carly, just to explain to you, um, it's things like pulling down the gloves to create space. It's things like stepping around your opponent with an overhook to create space for a body shot and not being in the position to be hit back. It's a being able to, as we spoke about Anista Marcel earlier, step in and out and around in the pocket to create space for your punches. It's uh, which obviously famously Tyson used to do. He wasn't a great inside fighter. It was just outside of inside range is uh, using one shot to open up an opportunity for another shot in close via like a body shot to an uppercut. And really nowadays, we don't really see too many guys doing that. Um, Mayweather was pretty good on the inside. He's pretty good at using his arms to block and create space for shots. 
Uh, and obviously I'm shadow boxing as I'm talking. Phil can't see because we're on the voice only chat, but I'm kind of picturing in my head what you would do and uh, and things that I've seen. But generally, like it's no surprise that, as Phil said, some of the best fights we've had in recent years had great inside fighting in them. Uh, you're right about the footwork as well, Phil. I mean, Judy Carly was asking us about Ray Leonard's footwork and why people don't do that anymore. And I kind of said, well, the reason that is, and just to answer your question, we'll, we'll you know, I'll tell you now, Ray Leonard's footwork was, was just excellent. You can't just do Ray Leonard. You can't just copy Ray Leonard's footwork. He was a really graceful mover. He moved like a dancer. You know, he had great, great footwork, both forward and on the outside. But generally, boxing has changed. And you made a good point about MMA, Phil. I think you see some of the... If you watch Johnny Hendricks uh, versus Robbie Lawler, you see a lot of old-school boxing techniques in that, with the hand fighting, with the pulling down of the hands to create space for shots, uh, you know, inside fighting. And that was one of the best fights in MMA history for me. So I definitely think there's a place for it. And, uh, hey, if boxers don't want to use it, let's make sure that the MMA guys are using it. And of course, before people get mad, I'm not saying there isn't good footwork in boxing. Nah, absolutely not. There's not. amazing boxers, amazing, a lot of them. I'm just saying that we don't view it as much as they, we used to when you watch all the fights, especially on the back foot. That's what I meant. Another reason, of course, that maybe the fighters aren't developing their skill as much nowadays is that generally fighters are moved in a more uh, safety first fashion. That Maybe the big fights don't happen. And in the past, when the best fight the best more regularly, you had to be more versatile. To be called and the best, you had to be more versatile. And nowadays, maybe you don't need to be because maybe you're not that good at fighting on the inside. Okay, we won't put you up against anyone that can fight on the inside. Maybe you're not that good moving uh, backwards. Don't worry, we won't, we won't give you someone who could outbox you. You know, and it, maybe that's another reason that fighters nowadays aren't as versatile as they used to be. And I'm not putting my old man hat on. I'm putting the analyst hat on. No, but you're right, and you're right. You know what, also? It's because as the inside fighting is kind of disappearing a little bit, we can say, it's simple as that. If you have two fighters that are pressure fighter, normally they're supposed to meet where? On the inside, right? Of course. As, as there is no more, no, no, nobody is willing to fight on the inside as much. Now you have one who is supposed to accept to being on the back foot. And you will believe that then people will work on it, but it's just some back and forth. It's like one one up pressure, one one e pressure, and there is the the lack of inside fighting kind of make the fights one dimensional in one way. That that's the problem. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, by the way, uh, as we're giving out recommendations, if you want good inside fighters, we mentioned one, Roberto Duran. We've uh, mentioned another, Pernell Whitaker, and Henry Armstrong. Uh, Henry Armstrong, and hey. Julio Cesar Chavez, you want to see a technical inside fighter? Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Th that's your boy right there. Uh, I would recommend, uh, uh, I'm going to call you Judy Lee, because you were briefly called Judy Lee when you did the face uh, app thing, um, and I'm sure you'll find that funny. Uh, but, my man, if you really want to see a great uh, display of inside fighting with everything that comes with it, defense, hand fighting, uh, using the elbows, combinations, watch Julio Cesar Chavez in his fight. Okay, go on, Phil. Which fight am I going to pick? Go on. Yeah, we take no, no, no. I'm no. picking a fight that Chavez won. Oh. Edwin hmm. Rosario. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's crazy wanna... because I'm the one always eye on Rosario. Yeah. And doesn't wow. end that well for him. But yeah, that, that's a great one for sure. If you want to see a great display of inside fighting, that's the one. But as Phil just said, if you want to see a great inside fight, watch Pernal Whitaker versus Chavez. I'll tell you what, watch Rosario versus Chavez first to see how great Chavez is on the inside. And then watch Pernal Whitaker versus Chavez to see how amazing Pernal Whitaker was on the inside. Because, and... my God, if he could beat Chavez at his own game, how... No, I'm going to swear, I'm going to curse. How fucking great was Pernal Whitaker? Do you know what I mean? The guy was a badass. But... And also, Judica, if you... In the boxing conversation, you manage to place Edwin Rosario, you will look super educated. People will be like, damn, that guy, he knows his shit. Because Edwin Rosario was an amazing boxer that everybody forget from the 80s, but he was amazing. Damn straight. I think you will, if definitely, if, if you, if someone asks you in the future, Judica, 
What's the best inside fighting display? And you say, oh, I think Chavez Rosario. They'll go, man, that man, that boy knows his shit. He's a young kid and he knows his shit. But hey, that's why we're here, to make it appear that you know your shit. So if anyone else wants to know their shit, just ask us. I'm going to do a little ad break here, uh, just gonna, before we get to the last Patreon question, which is a really good one. A uh, little ad break here to say, guys, please check out the Patreon. Please give this a, a, a like and subscribe on uh, YouTube if you're watching there. And uh, click the little bell so you get notifications. Even I get notifications from my own site because, you know, I want to jump on and watch these things as soon as they happen. And it's exciting for me. So it should definitely be exciting for you. Uh, and uh, if you're listening to on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a like and a, a five-star review because it helps people see us. Uh, you know, they're more likely to see us if they search for, say, MMA podcast or boxing podcast. We might be nearer the top of the search results and... You know, we, we want to get reach as many people as possible. Uh, and if you really want to support the site and uh, you're not, you're already a patron or you're not already a patron, that's fine. Maybe you don't want to be a, a monthly subscriber. We've now got merch, which we're going to put, we're going to drop the link in the, in the description. We've got merch so you can get really cool uh, sweatshirts hoodies, t-shirts, maybe a mug to drink your coffee in, maybe a face mask. If you, you know, maybe your country's got restrictions in place and if they haven't, please wear a face mask anyway wear a fight site face mask look cool maybe you might intimidate someone and they'll stay even further away from you and keep you even safer and keep your loved ones even safer as well because you've got a badass fight site face mask on and also if you go to the website www.thefight-site.com scroll right to the bottom of the home page there is an affiliate link on there to the always excellent hyperfly and if you want to get stuff for gi no gi leisure wear etc if you go and visit hyperfly via our site you're helping to support the site because we get a little cut of that so if you want more excellent content maybe not the shit we're, we're doing today maybe you're more an mma fan kickboxing fan whatever keep the staff paid support the fight site and we can keep bringing you excellent content and that's why we've got a great patron request by guys like dan demarco who's one of our top, top guys, uh, one of our best patrons, and he's been a fan of ours individually before we even started the fight site. And uh, we're on that same sort of kick today because Dan has asked us, what is Oscar De La Hoya's place in boxing history? Was he a better sports figure than actual fighter or a fighter overshadowed by his mainstream fame? What's his place among the greats? And what handful of fights can someone watch to get a grasp of Oscar as he should be remembered? It's a lot of questions there, but they are all about De La Hoya. So we're going to answer them all, Dan, because you're our dude. And also, Phil and I love Oscar De La Hoya. So it's a really, really good question. So, Phil, I'm going to throw the first bit over to you. What is Oscar De La Hoya's place in boxing history? Was he a better sports figure than actual fighter or a fighter overshadowed by his mainstream fame? To me, he was a fighter first and foremost. Maybe, he, I guess he was the golden boy of the 19th, especially the 19th. 90s, but yeah, he made a lot of money, was a golden boy, but I, I said the same thing about Canelo that I said about Oscar de la Hoya, even though they are different in the fighting. To me, Oscar, we forget how game he was, how good he was, and uh, how amazing he was, and he fought great names, so he beat great names that are greater than him, like Pernod Whitaker, Julio Cesar Chavez. He's not on that level. He catched them at the end of their career, or close to the end of the career, but I will guess that I will have Oscar De La Hoya. Uh, maybe Kyle is going to kill me here, but in my top 75 boxer of all time. Uh, it's a good question. It's a good good place to put him. I mean, I, I, I think I'd have De La Hoya in the top 100 uh, myself. Um, like you said, you know, he was really popular. He was like the Canelo of his time in terms of his popularity. I would argue as boxing was bigger than he, he probably was bigger than Canelo, which is crazy. Um, he really was a massive star. Um, you know, after Tyson lost to Buster Douglas, Chavez quickly filled that hole as the biggest star in boxing and continued in that way while Tyson was in prison. And uh, really the first time in a long time that there really was the biggest star in, in, in boxing was a little guy. And, uh, you know, Pernod Whitaker was robbed against Chavez, but he was never quite the star that Chavez was anyway, which is why they robbed him. And De La Hoya was the next guy. De La Hoya was the next guy to be a truly transcendent superstar now as you said like he fought a lot of, of quality guys but, but if you're going to give recommendations to dan to sort of watch i mean i wouldn't necessarily pick i mean dan go on the patron the fight will probably already be on there phil and i commentated on the panel wicker fight 
great fight to watch, sure. certainly. But we kind of said during the fight when we were watching it, this isn't really indicative of what De La Hoya was like as a fighter. De La Hoya was a big punching uh, left hooker. Um, he could definitely box. He, he could definitely fight. So I'm going to give you some recommendations of fights. Yeah. And Phil, I'm going to ask you to jump in as well. But For sure. the kind of fights that I would recommend uh, to watch uh, of uh, De La Hoya's would be from light welterweight and up. So he was a champion at uh, 130, 135. But generally, I think he really, really hit his stride at 140 when he fought. Obviously, he beat Chavez, but Chavez was past his best. But I'm going to say the uh, Miguel Angel Gonzalez fight, which is a really, really excellent performance from De La Hoya, um, which is when he won the WBC Super Lightweight title. Obviously, you know, light welterweight, as we're always going to call it. Um, beforehand, he had some you know, good performances against... Rafael Ruelas and uh, yeah. Gennaro Hernandez, Jesse James Leha, oh, like yeah, George Payas and stuff like that. But generally, I'm going to I'm going to point down in the direction of prime uh, De La Hoya, and his prime really starts from Gonzalez. Then he fights Whitaker, um, and basically after that, you know, there's a lot of there's a mixed bag of, of fights. But the fights that I really want to recommend are Ike Corte, who was the best jabber of the time, one and, of my uh, favorite fighter, Ike Corte yeah. versus. De La Hoya is insane. It's so, so good. It's crazy. It's a great fight. It's a great fight for both tactics, adjustments, and also yeah. action. The Let's action, there's little... not, it's not a lot of action in the fight, no. but when it is action-packed, it really is action-packed. But, but let's talk a little bit about that fight, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Because that, that fight is great. So it's really, Oscar is big, big. I think when he fought high quality, he just stopped Chavez a second time, if I'm correct. Yes, absolutely. So it must true. be late, 19, something like that, maybe 99, 98, I yes, don't know. Yes, it's his 99, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Aikwati, an amazing boxer, by the way. A little shout out to him if someone wants to catch him. Not the biggest name, but one of the best jab ever. Absolutely. I said ever. And and, uh, you, and I will fight it. Of the best fight I ever saw. The best jab I ever saw. And as we mentioned before, uh, Oscar De Loya, it took it time for him to develop that right hand of him. Yep. So when he fought Aikwati, he had someone who was very crafty and has the same weapon as him, which is the jab. So it's a great uh, lead hand fight. And it's crazy to see how uh, uh, they both adjust many times to what the other one was doing. So of course, it's not it's not a board. It's a very technical fight. Like they say, when they want to say something, it's very crafty and lack a little bit of volume. But it shows... Or strong mentally Oscar De Loya was though. So doesn't matter how you score that fight because it's a very close fight. I really recommend to watch it just if you want to learn about jabbing. Absolutely. Great battle lead hands. Sixth round is great. And obviously towards the end, it just goes crazy um, as De La Hoya desperately tries to win. And uh, a lot of people think uh, Ike won that fight. And this is what you kind of get with De La Hoya. Like, a lot of his fights, the big wins were quite close. So... The next one I'm going to recommend would be the Obercar fight, which is you know yes. really, really, really underrated performance by De La Hoya against a very underrated fighter in Obercar. So I recommend that one. And then you've got the Trinidad fight, which is obviously a really famous fight, but it does fall off a bit towards the end. But generally, like De La Hoya, you'll find he has fights that he lost that people think he should have won, and he has fights that he won that people think he should have lost. So I find that like the Panama Whitaker fight, people think you should have lost. The Corte fight, people think you should have lost. Uh, you know, but the Trinidad fight, you probably should have won. And also the rematch, but on the other recommendations I want to give. The two fights with Shane Mosley. So Mosley takes De La Hoya's O, the first guy to uh, to beat him. And it's an amazing fight. It really is an amazing fight. Then Mosley loses twice to Vernon Forrest. And then they, they rematch at light middleweight. And De La Hoya loses this fight. Now, we talked about the right hand. In this fight, De La Hoya had been working a lot on his right hand. And the big narrative of the fight was that he'd been working on his right hand. And you see him use his right hand really well in this fight. For me, this decision was a bad decision. De La Hoya deserved to win the second Mosley fight. Phil, do you have any recollections of that fight? Do you think De La Hoya Yeah, won yeah. Uh, I was going to ask. I think... Is the fight of the year of two thousand? That 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 that's the first one. The yeah, first well, one is the, mean the second one, right? But in the second one, De La Hoya deserved to win the second one. Yeah, yeah. I well, see. It was a few years later. Yeah, two thousand three. I, I was gonna say, from my recollection, it might be, might be, one of the last time you see uh, De La Hoya in his prime. 
After you're that, it starts to correct. be really bad. You're but correct. that fight, then, yeah, uh, the, actually, people might kill me about this, but I scored the two fights for De La Hoya, the mostly ones. Oh, I scored the, both, both of them. Both of them, wow. Yeah. I'm not going to kill you for it, but um, I, I, thought, I always think Mosley won the first one. But again, if you watch De La Hoya's career, you get to see so many other great fighters. That's what's great. And you know one of the reasons, if people want to to kind of like knock down the lawyer about the decision he has every time he has a close uh he fights like a big name like an elite name he doesn't go to decision he also got him critic because he fights those big names you know what i mean he, absolutely the lawyer is not that it's only like from like 20 years ago and when you see the names he fought okay Julio Cesar Chavez was old whatever we take care was still very very high it's a big big fight after you got guys like Julio Cesar Chavez, Quarty, Car, Trinidad, mostly Gatti, even though he has a size advantage. Opkins. Yuri Boy Campus, Yuri Boy Campus, yeah, Opkins, yeah. Pacquiao, so, Mayweather. So, so Oscar Delaware, we can say that's where I say he's the fighter over the money. Of course, he made a ton of money over those fights, and he always got, he was always the, the side A, so it was great for him to make all those money, but he took on names. Like if you compare De La Hoya's resume, with some other prime boxer of nowadays. Like, I, I'm not gonna shut on Terence Crawford because that's not his fault. But like, Terence Crawford is one of the best pound for pound boxer of nowadays. And he fought who? When you watch the- How old is he? Has, How old is he, 32? He's 32, 33. When you take, I don't know, Errol Spence years is, but he fought like one of two very, very good guys, that's it. And let's say it, Luke Gennady Golovkin, which is, by the way, <laughs> One of my favorite boxer ever. I love him so much. His resume is shit on them wise because <laughs> he fought he fought guys that are truly. When I say shit, I mean to be remained in his story from yes, like a couple of boxers. Course, it's course, huge. He beat a lot of good guys, but every time he faced someone very very good, which is we can say like two three times. Let's yeah. give him Jacobs and Canelo. What happened? It's a coin flip decision. So yeah. if you fight the best of the best, you're going to get those decisions in boxing. So that's not a knock on uh, on Oscar. But yeah, Shane Mosley in the 2000s was super, super good. And those two fights between Shane and Oscar are very interesting to see. I agree with you. I mean, we'll talk about the second one a minute ago. And I said, I thought Delore got robbed. In his very next fight, he, he definitely was beneficiary of a robbery against an unknown, unknown European, uh, Felix, Sturm. Felix Sturm. So, you know, <laughs> who obviously went on to have a pretty crazy career himself. But, uh, you know, they robbed him because they were desperate to make the Delore Bernard Hopkins fight. And uh, that's a bit of a strange fight to me. I'm, I'm, for me... I've always had. I'm never. I'm not. I, I'm not that Charles Farrell guy. I'm not going to say it was a fix. But these guys went on to be business partners, and for me, we know De La Hoya was a very tough guy. I'm not sure that liver shot would have put him down the way he went down. I'm never been sure about that. Um, I want to say the uh, last. The, go on. Go. On. I, I just wanted to add something. If you take those three fights in a row, Shane mostly rematch, Felix Terms bullshit decision, and Bernard Hopkins, those three fights. Yeah. It's kind of representative of De La Hoya's criticism and career because Shane Mosley is like a game fight. Mosley is super good, super dangerous. They fight, both very hard, very respectable fight to take. A lot of money, but like best versus the best, you can say. Then you get that weird guy that nobody knows in a weird fight that gives a new belt to De La Hoya. So that's where you can criticize him, his promoter and everything. But then what he does after that... <laughs> He goes to he fight one Hopkins. of the greatest middleweights of all time. Yeah, so you He's see what I mean? In my, I, I understand the criticism, which is more than fair. But at the same time, on three fights, he took two. I don't know if mostly can call be called an all-time great, but you know what I mean? He tied two very, very dangerous boxers from his era. So at the same time, I understand the criticism. But he did fought mostly Trinidad, Hopkins, and... Even when he was old, we talk a bit later, but he, he did took on the young, the young kids who were coming to take his throne. So, for this, I respect Oscar. And he gave Mayweather a good fight. He gave Mayweather. He a good did. Fight, we we talk about it later, but he did. did yeah. For sure. Um, what I want to say is, um, we're going to talk about this little last bit of De La Hoya's career because it's quite interesting. But uh, when he came back after like nearly two years out of the ring, I think after he fought Hopkins, he fought Mayorga, and I think people forget. De La Hoya versus Moyoga was a massive <laughs> fight. Everyone Mayorga wanted to see this fight. Moyoga was a wild man. 
And De La Hoya was looking to dip his toe back into the water in boxing. And that's a real crazy fight. A bit of a shootout, actually. And, uh, you know, De La Hoya, big left hook works again. And, um, you know, that's such a fun fight. It was a, for me at the time, you know, I was really like, you know, I've been in the boxing maybe really seriously, maybe about six or seven years. You know, I was still a kid. 2006, I was, oh, 18? Yeah, I was so 18 too. Yeah, I was 18. So I watched that fight live, I remember. Yeah, I watched that fight live because <coughs> it, the, the British newspapers, people were talking about it. De La Hoya was still a big deal then. And obviously he did it to see whether he'd get a fight with Mayweather, and he did. And uh, I think at the time, maybe the, f the, the first 10 years, maybe up to a couple of years ago, that was quite a controversial fight, the Mayweather fight. Now, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, it's competitive for about five or six rounds and then Mayweather adjusts and takes a win. But De La Hoya was already past his best, so it's a good performance. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, Go on. Kai. Go on. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Oscar's resume, just to be sure I miss nobody. And uh, just a shout-out, I love the Fernando Vargas fight. Oh, great fight. Amazing fight to watch, but that's not my question. My question was... I'm looking at the names he fought and like I, I give him the respect for that. And I'm thinking, what would have happened nowadays if Canelo fights Golovkin the first time and lose like decision or late TKO? Do you think people will turn on him or they will still watch him and, you know, he will get back? Because there's that thing in boxing now with the Mayweather uh, long reign is that losing is the end of the world. You know what I mean? And at the time, guys like Deloria, they could lose a fight, come back, win, lose. Nobody cared. They were still watch it. You know what I mean? And I'm just, I'm just wondering if nowadays we don't get those matchups because of the Floyd era, that losing is that bad when it isn't. It's okay to lose if you fight the best of the best. I'm fine with the guy being five win, five loss on title fight if he fights only killers. But that's not how the public see it nowadays. They will get, oh, he's a bum. He lost to that guy. Now that Golovkin lost to, to Canelo is a bum. You know what I mean? And that's my that's my issue. I wonder if um, Oscar would have been able to do that if he was past Floyd Mayweather's resume. So basically, I'm saying that Floyd fucked boxing up. Well, yeah. I mean, I do think Floyd uh, fucked boxing up to an extent, yeah, because all the kids want to follow uh, what he did. Um, I've got to say one thing. Obviously, when De La Hoya lost to Trinidad, people didn't criticize losing because people thought he won but he was generally criticized for the way he performed it wasn't you lost it was well actually we think you won but you've only got yourself to blame he was held to a high standard you know people didn't have a go at, uh you know didn't criticize De La Hoya for losing they criticized him for getting on his bike and trying to steal the last few rounds rather than closing the show so which even is then, fair. you know yeah which is fair um we could probably do a whole podcast about that fight um i highly recommend watching that fight as well um but yeah i mean De La Hoya did have criticism throughout his his career you know certainly after the mosley loss people thought you know maybe he's not as as good but what happened then was his opponents would fight the best so then mosley lost to vernon forrest and people were like oh maybe vernon forrest is the best and then he lost to Mayorga and it was like, oh, hold on a minute what's happening is all these guys are really good and they're all fighting each other and that's why they're losing and I think that's why De La Hoya doesn't really get criticised for his losses. I think there's only one bad loss, and that is the Felix Sturm fight, which obviously on his record is a win. I think everything else... But it isn't, as, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everything else, all his other performances, wins, losses, you can... You, you don't, I don't mean make excuses, but they're easy to contextualise. So, but the yeah. Sturm, that was, that was a bad decision and, and that was a cynical decision and Delaware should not have won that fight. If it was in Germany, he definitely wouldn't have won that fight. Uh, but certainly Mayweather, he was a bit past it. Steve Forbes, he won that fight, but he started getting marked up. I always he say, looked like, bad. He looked yeah, bad. yeah. But, I, but hey, I still thought he had enough to beat Manny Pacquiao. People oh, don't... Did, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. People don't realise nowadays, it's easy to go, oh, that's not that great a win for Manny. De La Hoya was clearly shot. It was an amazing win for Manny Pacquiao because De La Hoya is Oscar De La Hoya. And everyone thought, yeah, Pacquiao will probably do well, but at some yeah. point, De La Hoya is going to knock him out. I bet you thought exactly the same. Sh shout out to Taylor O'Higgins, uh, one of our colleagues at the fight site, the amateur boxing to, uh, boxer too. And uh, he made an article about Pacquiao De La Hoya yep. and, uh, on the fight site. So check it out. It's, it's very good. And also in the article, you can find 
a video of him and I calling that fight. Actually, we called that fight two times, but we're so stupid that we lost the first video, so we did it again, and it was <laughs> much better the second time. But uh, I recommend to watch it because we give a lot of context, and Taylor kind of uh, does a lot of insight on Pacquiao, I do on Oscar. It's uh, pretty interesting to watch. Before we talk about Floyd and Manny, I just wanted to resume it real quick about De La Hoya. The What I said earlier, that he was a good example of someone, a young talent, young champion, coming to take over the old legend of the sport. Like the Chavez, of course, is the main one. I cannot call Whitaker an old legend because he was still very good, but he was, though, very old compared to, to Oscar. And then there is the middle of the career of Oscar where he's start to lose a few fights and he's toe to toe with other guys of his generation. And then finally, like every boxer, uh, he becomes the one who's old and who's the target to the young box who want to become the number eight. So, of course, then he fought Floyd and Manny when he was late in his career. And I think he did very well against Floyd. You mentioned it real quick that the first six rounds are pretty competitive. I think that fight is more competitive than people remember it. But as I say, I think for a long time, people thought it was a robbery. They thought De La Hoya was robbed. I think nowadays it might have swung too much the other way. But um, I definitely recommend watching that fight. I mean, uh, it's interesting to see the adjustments made by Floyd once he gets the timing down on his right hand and also once he takes away De La Hoya's jab. But um, if you want to watch De La Hoya as an old man giving, you know, probably the best fighter of his generation, uh, well, definitely the best fighter of his generation, a really good fight, I think you can see... I think, you know, you can watch De La Hoya in his prime and go, wow, he was amazing. But it's good to watch him past his prime because you can go, oh, wow, you know what? He really was. He still had some good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah he sure. was a really good fighter. And you only get that late in your career if you were that good. I mean, Olympic and... gold medalist, uh, multi-weight champion. And, uh, you know, talking about where he is in boxing history. I mean, I wouldn't mm. rank him top 10 in any division. But he's an all-time great. He's top 100 he is. for me, just. I think the body language in both fights, to compare the Floyd and the Manny one, is that in the Floyd one, he's really in it. He, he believes he can win. You know what I mean? Even though he's... I, I thought he lost, to be clear. But he's in this fight. Just all day, not as good as he is. But he, he, he believes in that fight. Against Pacquiao, it really turns quick into a bit down. And at, at some point, he's really, what am I doing here? So that's really... There's a big jump between the Floyd and the Manny one. Even though there's only one year and a half between both of fights. And it's also due to the styling, uh, stylistic matchup, and also due to the age and the tear on Oscar. But, but yeah, the, the Manny Pacquiao fight, when he started to come back to your question from 10 minutes ago, at the time, I thought Oscar was going to win. Just because oh, I was like, he was gonna win, he's yeah. just too big. Yep. Basically. Because but you forget about it. Pacquiao, he comes from, I don't know which weight class, but it's like Flyweight. so small. <laughs> yeah, 112 pounds, yeah. And it happens that Pacquiao became even better as he grew up in weight. Like he, the gaining weight wasn't a problem for him. Like he, he really he really looked good at, at the weight, actually, uh, when they fought. And don't forget, don't forget, it was fought at a catch weight of 145 pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And De La Hoya Which had made La Hoya. seven for years, let alone 145. Yeah. And yeah. I think, if I remember correctly, it was such a bad weight cut that when he tried to put weight, water weight back on afterwards, he couldn't, he couldn't keep anything down. So he was not able to rehydrate and get strong as he would do usually. So I think, again, I want to make the case that, yeah, Pacquiao was amazing, but I don't want people to look at that at De La Hora and go, of course. No, oh, no, Pacquiao of course. always would have destroyed him. Now, I think, actually, that Pacquiao at his best at 147, like the Cotto Pacquiao, against, say, the... the the, let's say the Delahoy that fought Trinidad. I think Pacquiao uh, probably still could have won. Possibly. But just if you want to watch a fight where someone destroys someone else, watch this one. Because it's crazy it's that Pacquiao, who has the much smaller man on paper, turned the bigger guy into a counter puncher because he was just beating him up so bad. Yeah. And uh, if you like Oscar, it's a very sad fight to watch. If for some reason that are probably correct, you can't stand him anymore, you just want to get. But yeah, so to me, to answer the final question, Oscar De La for sure, whatever you think about him as promoter of the nowadays, if you just forget about this and look at the context and the fact, he's a great boxer. Nothing else to say. Much respect to him. Great left hand, great left hook, and a really lovely jab. And 
I, I just want to say that my final thoughts on De La Hoya are, I don't think about, you know, he was the golden boy. And he, I remember how loved he was when I was younger and everything, but he was a fighter. And you look at who he fought and how he fought him, uh, with a few minor exceptions and, and sort of, you know, exceptions to the rule. De La Hoya was definitely one of the greats of his era. And I think, um, I don't want people to think that he was like Ryan Garcia. Do you know what I mean? He was, in, he was like some Instagram famous guy. He was famous because he was a great boxer. Okay? Exactly. It's not the other way around. Nowadays, people get famous and they're boxers. De La Hoya was famous because he was a badass and he backed it up. And he backed it up throughout his career. And also, interesting thing about De La Hoya is the older he got, um, sort of in his mid-twenties, and the higher up in weight he got, the stronger he got and the more durable he got. And he became a really, really good fighter. You watch his early fights. I guarantee you, Phil, if he won the Olympic gold today and won a title at uh, super featherweight today and then at lightweight and we were seeing him get knocked down and everything we would all say he's never going to make it he's a hope job he's a hope job he's getting dropped by guys that ain't on his level Yep. and it's kind of like Canelo when he got dropped by Miguel Cotto's brother uh, Jose is a Jose no, Luis Cotto yeah, 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 yeah. everyone went oh my god that guy's a midget how's Canelo ever going to make the next step you know and now he's the best now he's the best. And obviously he had a close fight with Trout and then he lost badly to Floyd and then he had a close fight with Lara and everyone went, oh man, this guy just ain't it. No, he was it. Because what happens is, and Canelo, we don't want to diss, diss the guy too much, similar to De La Hoya, he has faced a lot of good fighters now. And when you face the best of the best all the time, you don't look the best every single fight. And De La Hoya fought a lot as well. I mean, he fought like, what, maybe just under 50 times or something like that. 45 times, 46 times. Um, but he fought a lot. I mean, he was really, he was out quite regularly for a superstar. He was out a couple of times a year, you know, pretty much every year um, for much of his yeah. career. So really good fighter. And um, similar to Duran, like if you, if you want to learn about the 90s, uh, if Ollie, if you're still yeah. listening, if you're still listening, you want to learn about, we're giving you a guy from the early days. We're giving you Ray Robinson. We're giving you Duran. If you want to learn about the 90s, Watch De La Hoya's career because you get to learn about so many other great fighters and then you'll go, the best way to get in the boxing really is to watch one fighter because you'll watch, say you watch the uh, Ike Corte fight, you'll go, I really like Ike Corte. I'm going <laughs> to watch more of his fights and then oh, maybe yeah. you'll see someone give him a good fight and you think, I want to watch. The reason I got in the boxing was I'd go, who's that? I'd watch them and I think, oh, that guy was good. Who was he? And before you know it, you start learning a lot about an era. Okay. That's how you get educated about the sport. So you sure. get educated. You have to watch with an open mind. And, you know, you can't, when you're really young, you watch a fighter and you probably only pay attention to the guy you're watching. So I say I want to watch a Roy Jones fight. I watch Roy Jones and I'm only looking at what he's doing. The only way to learn about boxing is to watch what both guys are doing and, and be open minded. And I think generally this podcast has been about appreciating fighters from the past. Uh, appreciating fighters of all eras, even today's. Well, I know we've thrown a bit of shade on them, but hopefully we've given you guys enough recommendations from today's guys as well. Um, to boxing still healthy, you know. Uh, it will be once this COVID thing's uh, done with, uh, or when they figure out a way to, you know, to do it more uh, safely, and you know, we get the big fights again. We're getting some boxing, but as of uh, recording, it's still not quite at the level we want it to be, um, which is probably for the best. And, uh, you know, boxing is just, you know, boxing's alive, boxing's great. But if you want to go back and look at more boxers, to any of the guys that ask questions today, I recommend that you listen to the answers to all of the questions because you'll find things that are interesting. And uh, that's what you and I do, Phil. You know, we're always talking to each other about boxing and uh, other boxing team members. And uh, it really is a, a beautiful sport. Yeah, it is an amazing sport. And just to finish on the Oscar for a second, yeah, it will probably surprise people, but they can find him online. He said that the best puncher, who we'll said the best puncher Oscar fought in his career? What do you think is the answer? Uh, oh, so I'm going to say the best puncher he fought in his career. I reckon he's going to say, well, I, you think he would say Trinidad, but I don't think he likes Trinidad. I think he's going to say Ike Corte. Yes, he did. He said Ike Corte. What did he, he say? Did. The jab? Did he say the jab was the most no, powerful? No, no. He, he said he, was the, he had the best jab he fought also, which is crazy because he fought Pernod Whitaker too. So he tells and you... 
Yeah, so crazy. And he said about Aquati, his punches were like bricks. He hit me and he would sting me. Every punch he would hit me with, it would rattle me. We can tell that by watching that fight because that is a immense fight. Um, as you say, don't go in expecting a war for the whole fight, but it's a really good tactical fight that every so often descends into a brawl. And uh, you see these two very classical boxers uh, go at it. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to say, Dan, if you only watch one fight, make it that one. Uh, you and you obviously agree, Phil. That's the one to watch. If you only watch one, watch I that, that's, that's my pick also. Yeah, I mean, you've done some great little uh, video highlights of Ike Courty. So, Dan, hit hit us up on the, on Twitter if you want Phil to reshare those. And that's probably the best time to tell uh, the guys. Phil, if anyone listening to this has made it to the end, uh, and I hope they have because it's been as fun to talk to you as I'm sure it is to listen, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at ASAPPIPA. So, A-S-A-P underscore P-I-P-A. And... I'm often near the fight side, so you won't miss it. I'm always spamming everything I do as content, so you probably can miss it. And also, for the people who are the patrons and are on Discord, I'm often on the Discord, and I'm always willing to to answer questions or give my text or even to listen to your text. I don't mind. I just like to share knowledge or questions. Question is great, better than knowledge, actually, with uh, anyone that is truly passionate by the any combat sport. I'm trying to to follow a lot of them, but if you got question about boxing and MMA, I'm here. Well, that's as good as any uh, way to find you. Um, obviously, I'm. A, I uh, probably look bad now if you listen to it at the end, but uh, I think Jorge Masvidal is going to knock out Kamaru Usman. So when this will be released, the fight will be over. I might look like an idiot. I might look like a genius. One two TKO. Well, if you look like an idiot, you're editing this podcast, so you could always edit that out, but I know you won't. I would sure. never do that. I would never you've got, do you've that. Got big, you've got big balls, and you'd rather have someone to call you an idiot. Um, yeah. Obviously, you guys can find me at Polgas Boxeo, P U L G A S B O X E O. Obviously, check us out at www.thefight site.com. You probably already know about the website, but if you're a new listener, welcome and uh, please check out our other content. Uh, this is great, but we do even better stuff than this. Um, if you want, again, if you want to hit us up on Discord, I often do like an AMA, like an Ask Me Anything on there. Uh, like Phil, more than, more than welcome to speak to any of the uh, Discord guys and the patrons. If you obviously you want into that, five dollars a month and you can join the discord and we have great chats on there lots of memes lots of silly stuff but uh lots of great combat sports chat of all the combat sports and uh you know you can speak to us actually speak to us not just text us you know you can jump in and chat and uh we also do watch along uh, marathons uh, that, that is open to the patrons as well so come and say hi on twitter and or maybe on the discord and uh look we just answered these questions if you want us to answer a question Pump up, you know, plump up the cash. Send us the money, and we will answer anything you want. We can go more in depth than this. Uh, Phil does video breakdowns. We do articles, that kind of stuff, uh, with gifts and lots of in-depth analysis. But uh, for shorter uh, podcast questions like this, it's ten bucks a month. You don't have to do it for the rest of your life. You can just do it. For, maybe you've got one burning question you want to know the answer to. You only got to sign up for a month and ask. And we will, and you shall receive. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. As I say, uh, we don't do these podcasts all the time. But uh, Phil, I'd love to have you on, man. I mean, obviously I talk to you all the time, but we don't really do it in this kind of uh, formal occasion. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you for having me in, man. It was a blast. It's great, man. And uh, no doubt, as soon as we press hang up on this call, I'll be talking to you again in like five minutes anyway. So it's, it's nothing new. But hopefully the the listeners uh, enjoyed it and. Uh, You've been listening to the Superfly Boxing Podcast presented by The Fight Site. Thank you so much and uh, catch up with you all soon. Yeah, stay safe, guys. Stay safe, definitely.